Yeah, uh, I think we are at time. So first of all, thanks everyone for joining the session. And today uh, we will have an uh, intro level uh, session for the tunnels project. I will also uh, cover the project updates part briefly. And uh, for this talk, I also want to talk, talk about some common pitfalls uh, as a maintainer I see Thanos users having. And I hope this can be some uh, key takeaways for you if, if you are using Thanos or you plan to use Thanos. So uh, first of all, a bit introduction about myself. So uh, I'm Ben, and I'm a software engineer at AWS. And I'm um, a maintainer for both Thanos and Cortex project. And you can find me on GitHub. And I also have a pack. So let's start with the introduction. Um, if we want to talk about Thanos, first we need to talk about Prometheus. But since uh, people attend this talk, I assume everyone probably already have some kind of background for Thanos. So I will, uh, so, sorry, for, for Prometheus. So I will not dive too deep. Uh, but the key thing to know here is that uh, Prometheus is known to be designed to work as a single application in a single machine. And it uses pool model to scrape metrics. It also has some uh, cool feature like TSDB, prompt call engine, and alerting feature, et cetera. Next, uh, I want to uh, walk you through a user journey who is using uh, Prometheus and how he can gradually adopt the whole uh, Thanos stack. So first of all, maybe everyone starts with Prometheus as a single uh, server. So you scrape some metrics from your exporter or application, and you set up your uh, visualization layer, for example, Grafana, and you can see your nice dashboard and graphs. However, you start to see some problems when there's a deployment going on for your Prometheus server. Um, if, you, if you only use a single Prometheus server, it, during the deployment, it will take down your Prometheus server, and it will take a few minutes to wait for it to get back, and then you will have a few minutes of downtime, and you can see some gaps in your Grafana dashboard. So a common way to solve this is to uh, set up Prometheus HA pairs, and basically it's you will deploy two Prometheus pods, and they both scrape the same data. So even uh, in this case, even you have a single Prometheus going down, you still have kind of the same snapshot in another Prometheus server, because they are collecting the same data. But this solution is not perfect, and the problem sometimes uh, can come from your data visual visualization layer site. Um, because Grafana, usually you will just use a single data source for Prometheus. So you usually put a load balancer in front of your two Prometheus pairs. It can be usually a Kubernetes service or something else. But let's say if we have a deployment going on for your Prometheus, it will try to take down your first Prometheus server, wait for it up and running, and then take down your another Prometheus server. So what will happen in this case is that if the first Prometheus server uh, went down, then the load balancer will route the query traffic to the second Prometheus, and it works fine. But however, when the first Prometheus server comes back, it, it doesn't have the metrics uh, when, when, he, when it was done. So if the load balancer uh, routes a query to the first Prometheus server again, you, will have, you can see the metric gap in your uh, Grafana dashboard. So this is something kind of like uh, inconsistent uh, metrics query view. So how can tunnels help here? So uh, I'm going to introduce the first uh, and second tunnels component here. Um, so we will try to deploy a component called Thanos Querier. And Thanos Querier can uh, provide a consistent global view by aggregating and deduplicate, deduplicating data from your Prometheus HPA pairs. So how does it do it is that we also need to deploy uh, Thanos sidecar components alongside with your Prometheus. And uh, this way, your Thanos query is able to talk with your Thanos sidecar through Thanos uh, store uh, gRPC API. And uh, with, uh, in, in this case, even though you have a single Prometheus going down, because Thanos query always try to aggregate from all your Prometheus, so you can kind of maintain a consistent view and won't have the problem uh, I mentioned before. So I think this is basically the most simple setup for tunnels, and for a lot of use cases, 
it worked really well. And let's talk about something different, for example, um, rule evaluation. So users usually start from using Prometheus to have, have rules to evaluate rules, like recording rules and alerting rules. This works, and this also works very well for most of the use case. But for certain use case, you want to have something similar to your uh, query uh, global view to have the consistent view of all, all your cluster or all your premises. So what you can do is to deploy a component called Thanos ruler. And this ruler basically queries Thanos querier for rule evaluation and stores uh, the recording rule metrics and alerts metric on its local database. And it's also able to send alerts uh, to Prometheus. So that's a use case uh, for rule. And what about some other use case, for example, um, like query or storage? So um, by default, Prometheus has its long uh, retention period set to 15 days. So probably most users start from, from, uh, with this kind of setup, and it, it works well. But maybe one day, your team has a different use case, and they want to look at long-term trending data for uh, maybe analytics or anomaly detection. But it's very hard to do this in Prometheus because Prometheus is just a single server. It has limited local storage. And it's definitely not designed to have long-term uh, storage. But um, luckily, Thanos has some solutions. So Thanos Sidecar, Thanos Ruler, and some other Thanos components, they all support flushing data to your object storage, such as S3, every two hours. So users can just configure a smaller retention time uh, in Prometheus. And store their long-term data in S3. And in order to query all the data stored uh, in S3, Thanos has a component called Store Gateway. And Store Gateway is basically kind of a, like a proxy to serve um, like the Thanos query load uh, from your S3 bucket. And it exposes the same uh, Thanos Store gRPC API. And now we have the long-term storage, and we are able to query data for long-term. But the problem comes uh, when you start to query. It, it's, it works, but you will find like the performance is really bad. And the re reason here is that if we uh, just uh, uh, query the raw uh, every two hour block, they are not compacted. Because for example, if you have a block every two hour, you will have uh, 360 blocks for a month. And if you run a 30-day query, you are basically querying all the 360 blocks back. And it requires a lot of I.O. to your S3 bucket, and, uh, which is not really efficient. So Thanos has a component uh, which deals with this issue. It's called Compactor. And it has two main functionality, compact and downsample. So compaction is basically to merge uh, your blocks with smaller uh, time range into a longer time range. For example, we can merge two-hour data into two-day, uh, two-day data into two weeks, things like that. And for the downsampling, it's something, uh, it's also for the long-term kind of trending use case. Um, for example, like in your raw block, you will have your samples every 15 seconds because that's what you have for your scrape interval. And, but if you look back your dashboard for like one year or six months, it doesn't make any sense to query like, those data with 15 seconds like, resolution, because that's too much. And you are not actually using all of them, because Prometheus has something called STAP. So it will only query, get only one sample every some interval. So with compactor perform downsampling, uh, it will try to um, reduce, uh, reduce the resolution from like 15 seconds to like five minutes or one hour. So when you query long-term data, your query will become much faster. So I think that's basically all the kind of the kind of one architecture we call like sidecar pattern, where you have uh, the, the metrics come from your in-cluster in Prometheus. And it's very easy to just deploy some sidecar to collect those metrics. But uh, I think now there are more and more use cases where the, the environment are kind of egress only which means you cannot deploy the sidecar to a different cluster and use your uh, Thanos query to find out a query and to send to that environment. Now we have more and more agent like hotel collector, Prometheus agent, and maybe just the Prometheus server. And they all use uh, remote write. And uh, 
Sonos also has a component that handles remote write, and it's called uh, Sonos Receiver. And Sonos Receiver, uh, it mainly consists uh, of two components, actually, uh, and they serve different functionality. And the first one is called uh, Sonos Router. And as the name uh, like suggests, Router is basically, it re receives uh, the incoming remote write request. It doesn't have any storage, but it just distributes or forwards the request into its backend. So this component is pure stateless, and you can scale up easily based on some, some, some metrics like HPA. And uh, the backend storage is called uh, Sonos Receiver Ingester. It basically uh, runs the same Prometheus time series database locally and stores the incoming metrics uh, into the database. So it also has a component, uh, internal component called Hashring, and the Hashring is used to distribute the time series into different uh, receiver nodes. And an important feature here is called uh, data replication because uh, we want to ensure data are high available. So when the uh, time series or samples coming in, uh, the receiver or router will try to replicate the data to different nodes so that we keep multiple copy of your data. So this is usually called another kind of approach or another pattern called the receiver pattern, but the both pattern like sidecar and the receiver pattern, they can they can like de deploy together to make it a hybrid approach. So next, I'm going to introduce some kind of uh, more advanced um, use case. For example, <clears throat> there's a component called stateless ruler. And the reason why we need this kind of stateless ruler um, is that the existing ruler uh, is like, like the graph hat. Uh, we deploy it in the same cluster because it needs to query uh, Sonos query. And uh, the issue here is that it stores all the data, like recording rules and alerts metrics, into its own local time series database for Sonos query to query. But the issue here is that it makes it super hard for Sonos query to horizontally scale up because time series database itself is, uh, is stateful. So, um, that's why we had a new kind of a different mode of ruler called stateless ruler, as the name suggests. It doesn't have any storage. What it does is that the ruler will try to evaluate the query from um, your Thanos query, and for the generated metrics like recording rules and alerts metric, it will try to remote write into um, the remote write path like, like router. So this way we can horizontally scale the stateless ruler component. And uh, yeah, I think it's kind of um, relieve some, relieve uh, the operator from uh, horizontally scaling up existing ruler. And uh, so this is about rule. And uh, there are a lot of questions coming from user about how can we improve the performance of our uh, Sonos query. And the whole Sonos query path is kind of complex. complex. But um, here we have a new component called uh, Sonos Query Front End. And it's basically kind of a proxy between your Sonos Query and your, uh, your data visualization layer, usually Grafana. So it has some kind of magic of uh, request uh, sharding. And it can shard either vertically or either horizontally, like by day. And it also does something like results caching, because uh, when users use their Grafana dashboard, they usually maybe it's highly likely to look at maybe similar time range or they look at the same dashboard. So it makes total sense to catch the, the results so that they can reuse and to make dashboard load much faster. And for your long-term storage, um, the component called Store Gateway, we also introduced something new, uh, which is the index cache and the trunks cache. And they are basically memcached clusters or can be Redis cluster, and they can basically cache what you query um, for your, uh, each block on S3 and make it much faster to serve the query results next time. So yeah, I think that's all I have for the uh, introduction part. <coughs> Sorry. Next, um, I'm going to um, talk about some um, common pitfalls I see. So 
as a maintainer, so I look at lots uh, on GitHub issues and Slack messages. I feel like the most kind of common pitfall or most asked question is, is about compactor. Because compactor is something users feel like very hard to handle, it's very hard to operate, and they don't know how to deal with this data and don't know how, how it works. So a, a question I got a lot is, um, like I have set up some kind of retention for my uh, data, but even beyond this kind of uh, time range, I still see my, my bucket, or, sorry, my, my blocks staying in my S3 bucket. And let's say I have a 10-day retention, but I can still see my one-year data there. And also, similarly, um, for downsampling, and users ask, like, why I cannot see any of my blocks getting downsampled, why I can only see my raw block here. So to understand this question, so let's first understand like, how Compactor itself works. So Compactor itself is basically a job, and it runs uh, in an infinite loop. And the job has three stages. The first one is compaction. The second one is downsampling. And the third one is retention, but this is not really deleting your data, but mark your data as uh, kind of uh, deletable and the compactor will try to lazily delete it, it after some time. So these three, uh, three stages, I think the issue here is that for each stage, you need to finish the first stage to go to this stage. For example, like if you want to have your block to be downsampled, you need to finish all the compaction work available in your, in your bucket. If you want to have your uh, retention to happen, you need to have all your compaction work and downsampling to finish first. So that's why a lot of uh, people ask why they don't see any downsampling, why they don't see any retention. It's because they have some kind of backlog in their compactor. And uh, like initially, maybe it's just uh, some compactor uh, or some blocks slow down. But over time, like those things piled up. So you will have a huge backlog uh, there. So how can we help or how can we troubleshoot this kind of issue? So um, the most important thing for me is to make sure your compactor itself is up and running. And uh, there is a metric called Thanos Compact Halted. And I recommend uh, every Thanos user to use it. And the common issue I heard is that I have my Thanos uh, sidecar running, and they are up and ready in my Kubernetes cluster. Um, but I don't see my compact compactor actually doing any compaction. This is usually because the compactor might encounter some uh, errors that they c it, it cannot handle. So it might need some kind of human uh, intervention, but it's something like uh, uh, the operator needs to take care and have alarm to properly handle it. Otherwise, you will have your backlog growing over and over. So after we ensure um, uh, the Thanos compaction uh, compactor is running, and it's not halted. Next, we want to identify like if we really have a backlog or, and uh, see how bad our backlog is. And uh, so Thanos provide a metric called Thanos Compact To Do Compaction. So based on its name, it basically tells you how many compaction you uh, are unfinished and you need to finish. So if you see some uh, pattern like this, uh, it goes up and down which is usually fine because it takes time for compactor to finish its work. But if you see some uh, ever-growing um, uh, series, which means you have kind of piled compaction over time, and this is something, um, it would be good to have some kind of alarm or um, to, to rem remind you that you know, the compactor has such kind of problem. So, so we, we talk about how to identify uh, the backlog and how to, uh, what about how to solve it. And the most common way to solve compaction backlog is just to shard your compactor. Because usually if you just run, run one compactor, it has limited concurrency and uh, it's only handling like limited number of compactions at a time. But if you can run different compactor shard and they are able to handle, like, for example, different external label or different blocks from different uh, clusters at the same time, then you have much more higher concurrency to catch up the whole uh, compaction backlog. But the issue here is that 
compaction like sharding, compactor sharding is not always a uh, silver bullet. And uh, the important thing here is also like we also need to find, find out what is the real bottleneck for your um, compaction slowness. So um, take some example from our production cluster. We do see some kind of issues like this. For example, like we found out that it's very slow to download uh, the block from your object storage. And there could be several reasons, but usually it's not uh, an issue if you use some uh, ob object storage from your cloud provider. And at this time, maybe you should double check your uh, concurrency to download your uh, block files. And there's a flag in tunnels to turn this kind of uh, parameter. It's basically uh, a block ha can have multiple files or objects in it. And with higher concurrency, you can download multiple files at a time for a single block. And the second reason um, is slow to write to disk. And uh, this it might, be, uh, might be common if you use some kind of uh, network storage uh, in some cloud provider, for example, EBS. And we had this kind of issue before, like it's very like, slow to download your block. And also during your compaction time, you need to write the data to your disk. And uh, we found out that after uh, increasing the IOPS for our EBS volume on AWS, we cut the compaction time by half. So the third point is slow to list objects from bucket. So Compactor does this all the time because it needs to understand what kind of blocks you have, what kind of blocks, uh, how many blocks they are marked as uh, deletion, how many blocks they are marked as uh, no, no compatible. Um, and uh, so they list your S3 bucket all the time. And an issue we found, uh, and maybe it's uh, kind of a specific issue, if you use something like S3. And for our use case, we turn on the object versioning in our S3 bucket. And over time, these list objects become super slow because it seems like S3 uh, list, list API implementation uh, will be impacted by the, num uh, by the version, uh, the object version you have in, in your whole bucket. So what we did is we tried to clean up the old, old versions. We don't keep too many version histories, and we also reduce the sort of like the retention time for your version. And after that, we found out that the list operation is much faster. <clears throat> so yeah, so that's, um, oh, by the way, so we also have these kind of compactor backlog uh, documentation. So if you really have these kind of issue in your production environment, please go to uh, the Sounds website, and it has some kind of detailed troubleshoot and uh, tools and uh, so to help you uh, fix this, this issue. Next, uh, I'm going to talk about another pitfall that's related to compactor. And I got this kind of question a lot because a uh, user will ask, like, we don't have any compactor backlog, but why I'm only able to see my block down sampled to five minutes? Why I cannot see any block uh, with one hour uh, resolution? Um, so I got a lot of um, issues like this, and I want to like clarify it a bit. So uh, first of all, I'd like to me uh, introduce like how this kind of downsampling works. So each block, if it needs to be downsampled, it needs to meet uh, certain criteria. For example, like if we, I have a uh, raw block, and I want to uh, convert this raw block into a five-minute like downsampled block, and the criteria here is that the block length or the block time range, basically the max time of this block uh, minus the uh, mean time of this block needs to be larger or equal of uh, 48 hour. So a common um, misunderstanding is that as long as my block uh, created like 40 hour ago, uh, it should be fine, but that's not the case. So you, your block needs to grow large enough so that it can be downsampled. And uh, similarly, for five-minute block, it's kind of similar. It needs to be uh, larger or equal uh, than 10 days so that it can be downsampled into one hour. It's not, not like the block age, uh, like what was 10 days before. It's, it's, it's not the same thing. But um, the, then let's take a look at how we convert a, a single like two-hour block, and eventually it becomes a one-hour downsampled block. So the first line here is um, 
is something we call block ranges. It's basically um, what compactor use, and uh, basically the, the block it will try to create uh, during the uh, compaction process. So for example, if you have two hour block, your compactor will wait enough time, and it will try to uh, compact your two hour block into eight hour, and then your eight hour block, it will compact to next level, which is 48 hours, and next level, which is 14 days. So it's like this, so there's no um, easy way to, I think it's something configurable, but this is the default value uh, compactor have. So let's say we have those kind of uh, two hour block as a beginning, and they got compacted uh, into 48 hour block. And now 48 hour block, it already meets our criteria because it's uh, larger than 40 hour, so we can downsample it into five minute resolution. And similarly, 48 hour block, and it, it waits long, a time, lo long time enough, it will be uh, downsam uh, sorry, compacted into a 14 day block with five minutes uh, resolution. And because of a 14 day block, it's already uh, larger than 10 day, it's able to be uh, downsampled to one hour. So the issue here is that even though we allow 10 day, like block, blocks larger than 10 day to be downsampled to one hour, because of the default compaction, like time range is 14 day, you need to wait enough time, like 14 day, for your block to be grow large enough, and then it's downsampable to one hour. And uh, so a lot of users, they will maybe come up with this kind of configuration, like uh, the first level, maybe I just need to keep one, two day, so that it's able to be downsampled to five minutes. And the second level of five minutes one, I keep like two weeks, so it's able to be downsampled into one hour. But um, that's usually not the case because you need to take your compaction time into account because you will have your two hour block merged together into, uh, into two day block and your two day block, it takes time for them to merge into um, two week block. So especially you have those kind of compaction backlog, it's usually like, when you, when you want to um, start the compaction, it's usually like your block got deleted before it's got even compacted to, to be large enough to be downsampled. So that was the second um, pitfall I want to talk about. And the last one I want to discuss is about a different deduplication algorithm. So there are two kind of deduplication algorithm in, uh, in Sanos, and uh, they are also used in Compactor. So the first one I'm gonna introduce is called one-to-one -one deduplication. So as the name suggests, um, this kind of deduplication algorithm, it deduplicates data that's exactly the same, which means they should have the same timestamp, they should have the same value, and this uh, deduplication algorithm is useful usually in the scenario uh, of uh, data replication of your receiver. For example, your receiver has some uh, replication factor set to three, which means a, sing uh, a single sample will be replicated to three different uh, uh, receiver nodes. And uh, you can see here, they basically have the same timestamp and the same value. And even though maybe one node they don't have this kind of, they could miss one sample because we do quorum, but it's also fine. And if you have the one-to-one -one deplication, at the end, it will be, all those samples will be merged uh, for the same timestamp and value. So eventually you will have what you uh, initially sent to Thanos, basically a non-deduplicated, uh, a non-duplicated um, series samples, basically. And uh, yeah, so if you use receiver, please try to use one-to-one uh, -one deduplication algorithm. And uh, the second um, deduplication algorithm is called penalty, and it's usually when you have a HA Prometheus pair, and this algorithm, uh, sorry, this scenario, it doesn't really work well with one-to-one -one because one-to-one -one only works if you have the same timestamp, but for HA pair use case, Usually the timestamp are different because it's two Prometheus server scraping, so there are two different processes. So for example, they might uh, replica two, they might have all the like, like samples delay one second. In this case, 
one to one will not be able to merge or dupli duplicate these two. So what we have is called uh, penalty duplication. What it does is basically it try to pick uh, one sample from one replica on each time interval, and uh, every time you when you have a gap, it will try to pick another like uh, replica where it has these kind of sample. So for example here, like initially we start picking uh, samples from uh, repli replica one, but then like replica one has a gap, it will try to switch to pick replica two. So that's a use case for um, the penalty uh, the duplication for your uh, Prometheus H shape here. So next, I want to give some quick uh, updates for project updates. Uh, because we don't have enough time, so I will just uh, um, cover like uh, some features. So we had two main releases um, since last KubeCon EU, and I want to introduce this feature called uh, Cabin uh, Proto Replication. So basically, uh, a request comes to router, and the router will replicate the request to receiver. And now the, uh, the current protocol for uh, the replication is all using Prometheus Remote Write. And, uh, but since uh, router and node, they are kind of, uh, and receiver, they are kind of internal uh, communication protocol. So tunnels can experiment uh, whatever we want. For example, like remote write 2.0 or something else, like more performant for tunnels. And one of the tunnels maintainer, Philip, he experimented with this called uh, Captain Proto, uh, which has better performance on the uh, deserialization of the uh, request. So there are some data I can show. Basically, they have kind of um, some reduction on the uh, memory usage of their receiver cluster, and I think their CPU usage of their receiver cluster also reduced by half. Next, I want to talk about uh, Thanos uh, PromQL engine. So since uh, last KubeCon, we're mainly working on improving the compatibility of the Thanos uh, Prometheus PromQL engine with the upstream PromQL engine. So we added support for query stat statistics, which is something when you specify stats equal to all, you, will you can see like how many samples you process. Now this is available in the new PromQL engine. And we added support for warning annotation, active query tracker, uh, and we also uh, added more um, PromQL function coverage natively in the PromQL uh, engine. So we added uh, more function support like native histogram functions as well as some experimental functions in Prometheus such as sort by labels. Next, I want to talk about the next step of the Towns project. And in our roadmap, we still need to finish uh, native histogram support. I think now the only thing left is the downsampling support for native histogram. And we are looking for a contributor. And the next big thing is Prometheus 3.0, because I think uh, Prometheus 3.0 uh, released yesterday, and it's time for like ecosystem project like Sanos to catch up and uh, to be more compatible with Prometheus. So we need to work on Remote Write 2.0, and we want to have a kind of overhaul UI for Sanos, like what Prometheus 3.0 does, and we also want to embrace. Uh, so open telemetry ecosystem to support OTOP metrics and a lot more. So yeah, I think that's all for today's talk. And uh, thank you, everyone, for, for joining. And I think we have only like two minutes for, for questions. Um, yeah, if you have questions, please, you can just uh, go to the mic and uh, ask. Or you can just ask. Thanks for the update, Ben. Um, I see OTLP support is roadmap for Thanos. Uh, I'm assuming that's on the ingest path. I was wondering if there's ever been any discussion of um, potentially building in like OTLP remote write into the Thanos receive router. Some of us work at companies that have our own proprietary TSDB backends and found it very challenging to like route Prometheus metrics into those backends without diving deep into open telemetry and completely replacing the collection layer. And I'm wondering if there's like any ideas floating around about ways to like more deeply integrate those into Thanos. So is your question mainly like uh, adding, uh, sorry, OTLP metric 
uh, support in in receive router or that's something else? Yeah, potentially. Um, I mean, that's like one component in mm -hmm. Thanos where all the metrics are flowing to and then getting remote written to yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. ingesters. But I mean, uh, Thanos ruler perhaps could remote write OTLP metrics directly into a proprietary backend. But um, uh, if, if it's not being collected in the ruler uh, coming directly off of Prometheus, it's hard to get those metrics into a proprietary backend without building out a OTEL collection layer as well. Yeah, I think we are definitely open. I think for the uh, the receiver support and the receiver router support, we definitely, I think we already have an issue. I think there have been some kind of discussion um, for the past couple months. And uh, I think we it's definitely on our roadmap and we want to support it. It's just uh, we need some contributor to help to, 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 to do the work, yeah. Cool, I think it's, it's time and uh, thanks everyone. Um, for Johnny. Thank you.